I always start by explaining my title. It comes from that bladder full of brains the Cambridge Don Gabriel Harvey, who is best remembered as Edmund Spencer's friend and Thomas Nash's enemy. In his copy of Ludovico Dominici's Facetiae of 1571, now in the Folger Shakespeare Library, Harvey writes about the Genevan scholar Anthony Rudolf Chevalier, who taught Hebrew at Cambridge from 1569 to 1572. Apparently, this is extract one on the handout, he often was in the habit of saying to me, come sir, let us go into the fields for laughing. Moreover, when first we came into the fields, instantly, without any cause, he used to laugh in a stentorian tone, nor did he stop laughing with the loudest voice, as though insane, until his breath failed. Ha, 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 he, 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 ho, 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 ha, he, ho. Nor did he cease at all until he had almost burst open. Never have I seen such a small man so gigantic in laughing. <laughs> the description of this behavior, almost Wittgensteinian in its oddity, is even better, I assure you, in Gabriel Harvey's original Latin. But it's worth pointing out that he resorts to English forms to imitate Chevalier's laughter. Ha ha and he he are among the earliest interjections in the language dating back to Eldritch's grammar. They are onomatic words that, in that they represent, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, the formation of a word from a sound associated with the thing or action being named. Onomatopoeic words are words imitative of sounds. The OED, my chief resource for this evening's talk, labels them as such, but there are other categories of words identified by the OED that I want to consider, including echoic and imitative ones. They are what the dictionary occasionally calls natural utterances, or what Thomas Wilson in the Art of Rhetoric of 1553, defined as words derived from the nature of things. Among these are ones made by people and animals, the sounds of the city and of the country, and the forces of nature. Between Old MacDonald and Oranges and Lemons, with a smidgen of the Beano and Blackadder thrown in, I shall look at some of these sorts of words. Talk, not, uh, talk about nonsense, and then turn to the drama of the 16th and 17th centuries. Look quite closely at King Lear, examine contemporary attitudes to the subject, and finish with a few short choice words about Martin Marplet. My interest in the subject dates back to looking at Tintin books in the French editions. Most of the French was far beyond my schoolboy abilities, and probably still is, but it was hard not to notice the fact that guns in French went pom pom whereas in English and American comics, their shots were represented by the familiar bang, bang. From the sublime to the ridiculous, anyone who listens to Marla's third symphony will know that the children's chorus containing the words bim, bam is meant to represent bells. Why do German bells go bim, bam when English ones tend to go ding, dong? Just as German pigs, I'm told, go grunts, grunts, <laughs> whereas English ones generally go oink, oink. <laughs> These are deep matters. And I venture into the world of onomatopoeic words with some trepidation. You will have to forgive me if I limit myself to English words or words of English origins and don't spend the rest of the unforgiving hour, or will it be an hour and a half, talking about Finnish terms for sneezing or Indo-European bird calls. Work has been done on these fascinating subjects, but I shall stick to English terms of the 16th and 17th centuries and ask you to accept that the ones I talk about are broadly onomatopoeic, echoing, or imitative. If English literature begins with Beowulf, then it begins perhaps not with an onomatopoeic word, but with an injection, what, that draws attention to what has come next. It's not so far from what hurt, the love of Chaucer, Spencer, and Bertie Worcester they're not exactly the same thing. Beowulf may not quite fit the bill, so what about the mid-13th century summaries are coming in? Not only does it display the long English fascination with the representation of birdsong, you sing cuckoo, 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 but it reminds us of the noises of the country. The ewe bleateth, the cow lurk, the buck farteth. At the other end of the chronological spectrum, 
It's hard not to think that modernist writers rather like these sorts of words of their effect. In Joyce, who's a portrait of the artist as a young man, the everyday noises of the words and of the human body are written into the book's texture and meaning. It has its ums and fts, its hoo-hoos, whoosh, its hoos and hoorays, but it also has the loud the loud smacking sound of a candy bag. And Stephen's mother playing the sailor's hornpipe dance on the piano for him. Tra la la la, tra la la la. The way Stephen hears the school's auditory world, this is number seven, is more significant. And from here and from there came the sounds of the cricket bats through the soft grey air. They said, pick, pack, pop, pop. Little drops in water, of water, in a fountain slowly falling in the brimming bowl. The passage's importance is emphasised by its near repetition at the end of the book's first chapter. In the soft grey silence, he could hear the bump of the balls. And from here and from there, through the quiet air, the sound of the cricket bats. Pick, pack, pop, pop, like drops of water in a fountain, falling softly in the brimming bowl. In the wasteland, T.S. Eliot makes generous use of representations of birdsong, jug, jug, and jug, 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 jug. Twit, 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 and to Drip, drop, drip, drop, drop, drop. Cocorico, cocorico. The poem is animated by natural utterances. It's O oh, and O, oh, O, oh, O, oh, O. Oh. It's ta-ta, sneer and snarl, chuckle. It's rattled bones, and more notably, at a crucial moment, it's pleasant whining of a mandolin and a clatter and a chatter from within. This wild linguistic impressionism is not deemed suitable for the discussion of grave ecclesiastical matters, but of course in the process of objecting to it, its critics draw attention to its comic liveliness. I could go on, but I must stop. There was much to be said about the two writers who learned so much from the market of dispute. Gabriel Harvey, the man who gave us the first recorded instance of cock a doo and of poo, the blurt of courtiers, the poo of good letters, and of his antagonist, Thomas Nash, the originator of pitch and helter-skelter, as well as much else. One of the pleasures of looking at this aspect of the history of the language is to see how quickly and easily new onomatopoeic words arrive, turn into something else, and sometimes disappear. Authors were well aware of this ability to metamorphose. In Troilus and Cressida, Shakespeare's Pandora sings of love's pains and pleasures. These lovers cry, oh ho, they die. Yet that which seems the wound to kill doth turn, oh ho, to ha ha he. So dying love lives still. Oh ho, a while, but ha ha ha. Oh ho, groans out for ha ha ha. Hey ho. <laughs> or, as the great Thomas Fuller puts it, rather less indelicately, ha is the interjection of laughter. Ah is an interjection of sorrow. The difference between them very small, as consisting only in the transposition of what is no substantial letter, but a bare aspiration. How quickly in the age of a minute, in the very turning of a breath, is our mirth changed into mourning. And now let us go and practice what the usual Walkerdean Horde did in a trick to catch the old one and go. I like this one. <laughs> Thank you very much.